Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Wherever you're joining in from, hello. At the time I'm filming this, it is early December, and for many of you, this means that we are speeding towards your biggest and busiest recruiting timeframe of the year, winter quarter. But no matter when you're tuning in to watch this content, you're here because you have questions about the hiring landscape. Namely, how in the heck do we address generational differences in the workplace? And how do we prepare to hire and welcome candidates who likely care about different things than what we cared about? Today, I invite you to embrace the Gen Z era and think critically about how your company can address the policies and values that Gen Z cares about. Thank you so much for making an effort to be here and committing part of your day to learning. I promise to make this next half hour very worth your time. Here's our agenda for today. I'll start by talking about the current UW student population to illustrate to you how the demographics of our student body have changed as a result of Gen Z enrollment. Then we'll talk about the timeline of Gen Z's upbringing and how that's affected the traits they grew to have, and then how that affects the values they have and the workplace characteristics they care about. I thought it might be helpful to dive a little deeper into that topic by talking about the specific values that Gen Z Huskies might care about. So we'll get into the intersection of generational identity and student identity. And to round out that second section, I'm going to get into the negative stereotypes that you might've heard about Gen Z. But I'm also going to flip the switch and talk about the negative stereotypes that Gen Z might have about you. So we're going to level set with each other. And I wanna be candid that both generations have work to do to understand each other. And it's important to discuss that. Lastly, I wanna make this presentation tangible and actionable. So I'll give you some tips when it comes to approaching recruitment and retention of Gen Zers. And I hope everyone can walk away feeling empowered to connect with each other and foster lasting change. Very quickly, let me lift the curtain and introduce myself. My name's Leah, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Employer Engagement and Communication Manager at the UW Career and Internship Center. If this is your first contact with the CNIC, hello. We are the centralized career center on campus that provides career guidance to students of almost all majors and school years. Everyone in our office works to connect students with a different thing or audience. So students with internships, students with scholarships, students with mentorships. I work to connect students with employers like you. So my role is focused mostly around outreach and event coordination, basically any type of event or opportunity where employers and students get to connect. So thank you so much for allowing me the chance to speak to you today. Now, before we begin, I have to remind you that today's presentation is asterisked. Yes, we're going to talk about Gen Z today. And yes, I'm going to posit some things about Gen Zers and I'm Yes, I'm actually going to posit some things about other generations too. Don't worry, we're well researched over here. I did my homework. But while the things I'm saying may be true on a generational level, everyone's situation is different. Not all Huskies are Gen Zers. And even if they were, they wouldn't all think or feel or act the same way. And therefore, you're not required to react or feel the same way about the content I'm going to share with you today. I want you to recognize that the content in today's webinar is kind of lofty. Generational differences are really hard to talk about. And today's webinar might require you to think critically about your work, your interactions with Gen Zers, or your team's narrative about Gen Zers. As your presenter, then, I get the very fun role of moderating this conversation. And I want you to know that I'm presenting to you today from a very, very, very interested, but unbiased place. To address what I assume is the elephant in the, in the virtual room, while I might look young or sound young, I am actually not a Gen Zer. I'm a millennial, so this content isn't personal to me. Um, and I want you to get the most out of this presentation. So whether you're tuning in to this webinar in December 2023 or sometime in 2024, please reach out to me, ask me your questions, tell me what you're struggling with. But my ask to you is that you get a little introspective with me today. And if you're a millennial like me, or a Gen Xer, or a baby boomer, get comfortable asking yourself how things could be different in your workplace if you took some of my tips today to heart. Let's begin. I want to start by sharing with you some information about the UW student population and how it's been changing year over year as Gen Z enrollment grows, basically answering the question, what does the typical Husky look like? This graph depicts the fall headcount for the Seattle campus, Seattle only, through the past 10 years. 
So you can see on the left-hand side, we're starting off with the 2014-2015 academic year. And you can see that in that school year, fall headcount sat at just over 45,000 students. And through the past decade, we've grown a lot, right? You can see we just celebrated our big, biggest headcount yet in the 2023-2024 academic year at just over 50,000 students. Now, this is the exact same graph that you just saw, but I've broken it down into this very fun rainbow that showcases class size. So bear with me while I explain this and follow along the key to class size as we go. You can see that located on the left-hand side of your screen. Basically, for every single bar that's on this graph, we're going to start with freshmen at the top in blue. And as you go down the graph, we grow in terms of class size hierarchy, right? So freshmen at the top in blue, sophomores in orange, juniors in red, right? You get the picture. Now, backing up from this graph for just a second, we know that Gen Z is defined as people born between 1997 and 2012. And if you didn't know, now you know. So for those born in 1997, Assuming that they followed a quote unquote traditional schooling timeline, they would have graduated high school as the class of 2015, which means turning your attention back to this graph, there wouldn't have been hardly any, if any at all, Gen Zers at UW in the 2014-2015 school year, which again is that bar all the way to the left-hand side of your screen. But in 2015, they would have entered as freshmen. So you can see um, the second to the left-hand side graph, the 2015-2016 school year, you can see I've outlined that portion in blue and pink. In 2016, then, those freshmen are going to become sophomores, but the class of 2016 just graduated high school, so they're coming in as the new cohort of freshmen. So you can see as we move along, I've highlighted each progressing portion of Gen Z in pink. And as the years progress, Gen Z gets older, new waves of Gen Zers come to school and they're starting to take up more and more of the student body. By the 2019-2020 school year, it's fair to assume that most of the undergrad student population and much of the grad student population are Gen Z. And certainly today in the 2023-2024 school year, almost all of our student population could likely be considered Gen Z. That's what I want to illustrate to you in this graph. And the reason why that's significant is because much of our student population data has changed since 2015. Take a look at our data on underrepresented minorities, for example. You can see that the orange representing underrepresented minorities has grown from just around 5,500 in 2015, which is again, the school year where Gen Zers would have come in as that new cohort of freshmen traditionally. And now today it's at almost 8,000. Our international student population, similarly, has grown from about 7,000 to over 8,000. Getting a little bit more specific on minority data, here's our race and ethnicity data. I want to focus specifically on our Hispanic or Latino, Asian, and biracial or multiracial student populations in particular, which have grown significantly, again, since 2015. I'll highlight here, Asian population is in red, Hispanic or Latino population is in yellow, and two or more races is in pink. One last graph for you, this one on residency data. And by residency, we're talking about residents of Washington. So orange means you came from Washington. Domestic non-resident in blue means you're a US citizen, but you came from out of state. And purple meaning international. You can see that the resident data in orange pretty much stayed the same, hovering right around 28,000 students. But look at how many more out-of-staters and international students we've been welcoming to campus each year since 2015. All this to say, I know that I walked through those graphs pretty quickly, but I really just wanted to leave you with this sense and, and, and knowing that Gen Z is diversifying our student population in dramatic ways. A UW press release from last fall, fall 2022, announced that we had just welcomed our largest and most diverse freshman class ever. We welcomed a record number of underrepresented minority students, a huge amount of non-traditional transfer students, and a huge number of international students. This year was relatively simil similar. It cannot be disputed that Gen Z is changing our student body which means that when you come to campus to attend a career fair, table, send a recruitment message on Handshake, really any time that you interact with a Husky, you have to take their background into account. I list some of these examples below. Perhaps they don't speak English as a first language. They might be interested in your diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. And if you're approaching DEI work at all, right? Among others, 
What I really want you to walk away understanding from this section is that students are bringing new perspective and needs to campus, and that's changing how campus systems respond to them. Remember, all students go to college to, drum roll please, get jobs, right? So the college experience is very much linked to, to, to job experience. And we have to think tangentially about this. The values students bring to college is going to affect how campus responds to them and therefore how campus shares information with you, the employer, and therefore how you, the employer, come to campus and interact with our students and therefore how students interact with you. It's all a big system of equal uh, a big ecosystem of influence, excuse me, and students are at the helm of that. Which means that we really, really, really need to care about Gen Z, and we really, really, really need to care about what they value in the workplace. So let's dive in. Let me iterate some of the information we've already covered just in one nice, neat slide. Remember, Gen Z is roughly defined as people born between 1997 and 2012 which makes them digital natives. Many of them never knew a world pre-internet, pre-smartphone, pre-social media. The lives they lead online and the lives that they have in person are intertwined. They're more connected than ever and they're more resourced than ever. Finally, remember that data shows them to be the most diverse generation. They're the last generation to be predominantly white. Gen Z has significantly, or is, excuse me, significantly more likely to be children of immigrant parents. One in four Gen Zers have lived in poverty. Nearly half of them come from low-income families. And one in five identify in the LGBTQ plus community. This slide encapsulate a lot, encapsulates a lot of stats about who they are as a result of when they were born. Which brings me to my next slide. What has occurred in their formative years? What, what social events have defined Gen Zers? Well, in 2012, they saw the election of the first Black president, Barack Obama, even the oldest of them wouldn't have been allowed to vote necessarily at this time, but it's likely the first election that they remember. AI was also introduced in 2012 with everyone's favorite smartphones, smartphone voice, Siri, and AI has only continued to advance through Gen Z's childhood and teen years, and now they're entering the workforce and influencing how we think about AI in career exploration and recruitment. In 2013, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin was murdered, spurring the country into a political and social movement that we know as Black Lives Matter. Much of Gen Z was marching in Black Lives Matter movements and protests, sharing and uploading online content, and reading about the unrest in the news. In 2015, they saw the U.S. Supreme Court strike down bans on same-sex marriage. 2020, ugh, the, faithful, the fateful year of 2020, uh, it brought us the COVID-19 pandemic, which shut down the world, forced us all inside, and no one was affected academically more than Gen Zers, many of whom were just finishing high school or even just finishing college and were forced into virtual, emotionless graduation ceremonies, and for those still in school, virtual, sterile learning environments. And this is just the short list. There are many other nationwide and regional events that would have occurred during Gen Z's formative years. But I share these first two slides about their background and upbringing because I wanna share with you the effects of these backdrops on Gen Z. Nature and nurture, how do they interact to bring us this generation? Well, given their own diversity, they're more progressive than previous generations in social issues that deal with diversity. So social politics as they intersect with race, for example, or sexual orientation or religion. Given their digital upbringing, they're extremely proactive about learning. They can Google anything in an instant, they digest content quickly, and they can spit out a summary in a 30 second video to share around the globe in a second. They're academically advanced and efficient, resourceful people. But they're also incredibly lonely and far more likely than previous generations to have mental health issues, such as anxiety or depression stemming from their digital upbringing. Their hyper-connectivity online makes them less connected in real life with many of them feeling like the digital world is safer and it's this endless cycle, even though it makes them feel more isolated or it has them playing the comparison game. Gen Z grew up during the Great Recession and they saw the effects that that had on their families and their childhoods. And as such, many of them are financially minded and extremely pragmatic about their spending, especially when it comes to really expensive things like college tuitions. Remember too, that because they grew up in the age of the internet, they grew up with things like online reviews and viral content, which can share information about what's good to buy and spend your money on and what's not. 
And lastly, perhaps because of their diversity or because of their connectedness online or because of their upbringing or all these things together, they're very politically minded and they're outspoken about activism and they're interested in making a difference. So here is what you have probably all been waiting for, a list of all of the things that matter to Gen Z in the workplace. If this is something that you're interested in and bringing to your team, I'd recommend that you pause the recording now and take a screenshot of this. Starting at the top, organizational commitment to social impact. They want to know that you care about this as much as they do about things that matter. Second, organizational commitment to DEI work and a diverse team. Gen Z wants to, you to care more about diversity and to show it in your leadership and workforce. A personal belief in impact. Gen Z doesn't want to just feel like their organization cares about making a difference, right? They personally want to feel connected to their role and understand how they fit and contribute to the hierarchy of change. Salary and compensation. Gen Z wants this to be appropriate. They want to see equity among roles and genders, and they also want to not care who knows it. They want transparency. And while we're talking about transparency, let's apply it to the whole organization too. Organizational transparency and information sharing is tremendously important to Gen Z. They want to know how the company is doing and when they can expect things to happen. Mental health benefits, this might look like mental health Fridays once a month or insurance benefits that enable people to seek out therapy. Hybrid work models, Gen Z wants to know that you trust them enough to provide them with the autonomy they need. Opportunities for career advancement, can they move up? Do they know your average timelines for promotions? How do they seek these opportunities out? And lastly, community and connection. In a world where they feel more isolated than ever, they care a lot about fostering connections in the spaces where they are all the time. We spend, on average, a third of our days at work, all of us. Gen Z really wants you to care about creating space for them to build relationships. Now, I'll be honest, as your presenter today, that a lot of this information I just shared with you is information you can find online. I did the hard work of consolidating it into a slideshow uh, presentation for you, but still. So I wanted to add some additional colors specific to the University of Washington. Chances are high that you're attending this presentation today because you care about recruiting Huskies, or you at least want to learn how. So I feel like it's appropriate to talk to you about the average Gen Z Husky and why this population specifically might care a little bit more about some of the values that we've already talked about today. So to start off, Salary is one of the top factors that Gen Z Huskies will consider for a myriad of reasons, all of them based around one topic, Seattle. Whether you're tuning in from somewhere else in Washington or an entirely different state, I don't need to tell you that there's a reputation about this city that it's expensive to live here. Indeed, off-campus housing for students in the university district here on campus can cost students over $1,000 a month in rent. I shuddered when I heard that. I paid $425 for my apartment in Wisconsin in 2013, and I thought that was a lot. Many students will be entering the workforce with tremendous student loan debt, as another point. Uh, many established families here in Seattle earn too much to qualify for financial aid on paper, but the high cost of living here in Seattle doesn't allow them to fully fund their child's education, and that prompts many students to take out loans. Post-graduation, many students might plan to stay here, again, one of the most expensive cities in the U.S., so money's on their mind. And finally, to round out the compensation talk, UW is a highly prestigious university, and we're proud of that, but I would imagine that comes into play for students when they think about their degree and why they went to college in the first place. Many of them chose to come here because of our credentials. We're a top three U.S. public institution, and I can imagine many students would believe that would likely earn them a well-paying job in a high-achieving industry. So we have to acknowledge some students' belief that their status as a Husky should allow them more. But it's not all about money. So flipping the switch here, I want to stress that Gen Z Huskies are going to care perhaps a little more than the average bear about social impact because many of them grew up here in Washington and even our out-of-state Huskies have lived here for, you know, two to four years. And when you live in Washington, you can't not care about social impact because you see affected persons or you're required to follow certain laws every day. I'll acknowledge Seattle's housing crisis here, for example, which has affected the city for decades. 
I'll also add a shout out to Wisconsin or to Washington's sustainability laws. Um, as an out-of-stater myself from Wisconsin, um, I was blown away when I moved here that there were compost bins on campus or that I had to pay a sugar tax if I wanted to buy a regular Sprite or that I had to pay eight cents for a plastic bag at a grocery store if I forgot my reusable ones at home. Students live in a state that's known for its progressive policies and their time here shapes how they go out and think about the world and interact with the world. Two more that I wanna talk about. So thirdly, Gen Z Huskies are going to care a lot about your remote work options. We've all heard about Seattle traffic. No one ever wants to be caught in traffic in general, but especially not here. Um, and the city itself is built around public transportation as a result. So we have light rails, buses, and streetcars and trolleys here. But taking this even deeper, the pandemic shut down many of our downtown offices. And even now in a post-pandemic world, these offices are still shuttered. Seattle still ranks number two in the country for remote work. So the students that were here during the pandemic witnessed that, and they know that hybrid or remote work is possible, and they're going to ask you about it. And finally, Gen Z Huskies are going to want to hear more than ever about your commitment to DEI work. They live in the fifth most diversifying big city of the decade. So that's an active, uh, an active verb. It is constantly diversifying. And you already saw stats in my first slides that showed how our student population has grown more diverse over time. This is something they really care about. So based on my presentation so far, I understand that I'm talking about Gen Z in a pretty positive way. So I do want to take a step back here and acknowledge that for all of the amazing things about Gen Z, their vision drivenness, their commitment to impact, their resourcefulness, there are also some stereotypes that we have to acknowledge. And remember, I'm not Gen Z, so this isn't too close for me. <laughs> okay, here we go. Common stereotype number one, they're entitled or they don't have a good work ethic. Number two, all of these rather similar. They don't wanna start at entry level positions or they want promotions right away or they're more likely to renege on an offer. Number three, they don't wanna work for the government. And number four, they're so connected, it's actually kind of scary. <laughs> so the next slide I'm going to flip to is what I assume Gen Z would say in response to these negative stereotypes. Or basically, in other words, my attempt to help you understand the why behind these stereotypes. It's not exactly that they're wrong. I'm not going to disprove them necessarily. But I think that once we make the effort to understand why they exist, we can start the process of working past them in ways that contribute to productive, happy, healthy workforces. Okay, here we go. So to the first stereotype. I actually do think Gen Z wants to work hard. I don't really know of anybody that doesn't want to work and produce good results for people. We know they're resourceful and that they're efficient, but perhaps they feel like they don't have the right tools to work hard, or they might feel they're undercompensated for their role, or they might feel disconnected from their role or their team. Which makes me think, is there more that employers can do on the hiring and recruitment end to set healthy expectations? I'll also point out that this same statement was said of me 10 years ago when I was entering the workforce. Millennials are so entitled, and I'm willing to bet it was said of Gen Xers and baby boomers and of every predecessing generation when they were young and graduating college. Perhaps this is just a generational growing pain. To the second stereotype, you may be right. Thanks to the internet, Gen Z can easily Google what other people make or what's average or typical for a certain role. They are striving for well-compensated opportunities, which makes me think again, is there more that employers can do on the recruiting and the hiring end to set healthy expectations? It's the same question as before, and I'll talk about this more in future slides. Common negative stereotype number three. Remember, Gen Z are activists. They want to be a part of change, and change oftentimes happens in the government. So yes, I'd argue that many of them actually do want to work for the government and nonprofit organizations, but perhaps there's something that's holding them back that they don't trust, which makes me think, how can government and nonprofit organizations create trust? Last one, yes, it is a little unnerving how fast they can find information, and maybe it is kind of annoying that they think they know it all, but think of what a great asset that can be for your team. They're resourceful, they're pragmatic, they can disseminate information very quickly, which makes me think, is this a skill set you're not utilizing that you could be? 
Now, I asked you at the beginning of this presentation to get comfortable being maybe a little uncomfortable. And I'm gonna turn this presentation around on you a little and remind you that for all the negative things being said about Gen Z today, Gen Z also has some negative stereotypes they've narrated about their preceding generations. And what kind of unbiased presenter would I be if I didn't address these today? Remember, this is all in the spirit of acknowledging our differences and recognizing that they don't pit us against each other, they make us stronger for knowing them. So for these negative stereotypes, I have four. Number one, they judge me or they put too much pressure on me. Number two, they won't communicate in the ways that I'm used to. Number three, they're intimidating. And number four, they won't pay me enough or they'll take advantage of me. So now that you know some of the stereotypes Gen Z might be assuming about you, the millennial or the Gen Xer or the baby boomer, here's what I'd encourage you to ask yourself in response. So that first stereotype, ask yourself, do you have a written internal narrative about Gen Z? Do you feel like they're entitled or that they don't work hard enough? Even if that's true, does it accomplish anything to think that way about that? Does it affect the way that you interact with them? Now, these are really hard questions. And if you're thinking about this right now, I applaud you for doing that. To the second stereotype, you know as well as I do that just because we're not TikTok savvy doesn't mean we can't connect. We are all part of much more social generations than Gen Z, and we can teach them a lot about how to network and create face-to-face -face human relationships. That's power we can leverage. To the third stereotype, Perhaps this is a narrative that Gen Z has written about you because they're known to be anxious and isolated and everything feels more intimidating when you're anxious and isolated. Again, is there work that we can do to build connections? And finally, to that final stereotype, you know as well as I do that providing larger salaries and better compensation isn't as easy as waving a magic wand. Everyone wishes they could pull from the money tree. It's just not that simple. And for as long as it's not, employers need to be as forward as possible when providing information that relates to compensation. Not just setting expectations about salary, but setting expectations upfront about advancement opportunities and benefits too. So now I'm sure you're reeling from all of that stereotype talk and I didn't wanna leave you feeling like you just attended a therapy session that you didn't sign up for. So I wanna share a final section here that I hope will provide with you with some concrete tips so you can walk away feeling like you can do at least one thing to better recruit and retain the new generation entering the workforce. At the beginning of this presentation in my agenda, I promised you a three-step approach and I want you to keep this in mind as I progress through the end of this webinar today. First, I want you to have a conversation with your organization's leadership team to understand where the gap exists. Perhaps you're doing a lot of the things I've talked about already, but perhaps you're not. If there's a gap between what your organization is doing and what your organization could be doing to prepare for Gen Z hires, where does that gap exist and what needs to happen to bridge it? Secondly, some of the things I'm about to talk about might be things you feel you could address pretty quickly. And I understand nothing in the workforce happens super quick, but you know, within the next quarter or two. Gen Z is entering the workplace now through 2034, with more and more of them graduating and looking for jobs. You're likely preparing to head to a career fair, maybe in the next two months, or maybe you're already starting your recruitment effort efforts for summertime. So the more that you can do now, the better. And thirdly, start planning ahead for the big stuff that's going to take longer to change. And I say this for two reasons. Number one, the more time you make for this now, the more committed you'll be, and the more likely you are to set yourself up for organizational change in the future, right? You've already gone through the rigmarole of coming in and watching this video and starting a conversation about Gen Z values. So don't stop now. And number two, because you're going to get asked about it. Gen Z are applying for jobs. They're interviewing. They're talking to their colleagues. They want to know you care. You don't have to have this big stuff checked off and done right now, but you should demonstrate that you're working on it. And that's good enough for right now. So let me give you some places to start. I have eight opportunities I've identified for you, which I've organized into an order that I think reflects the easiest to the hardest. Starting with revising your job posting language. We've talked a lot in my stereotype slides before about setting appropriate expectations and boundaries. 
This starts as early as you can get it, like your job posting. This is the first place Gen Zers are going to learn about you. So set appropriate expectations up front for your workplace. This might look like posting salary and compensation information. And going back to my earlier slide about the intersection between Gen Z and Huskies, it's actually now law in Washington that employers have to share that anywhere that they're posting jobs. So if you're posting those open roles and responsibilities to Handshake or Indeed or LinkedIn or anywhere else, if you're posting it to Washington, it's got to be on there anyway. So Gen Z Huskies, whether they're applying for a job here in state or out of state, they're going to expect to see this. This also might look like setting appropriate expectations about your role's responsibilities and requirements. So in general, I don't think Gen Z is averse to making a smaller salary. Many of them just wanna feel like their salary is appropriate for their workload or that they're qualified to do the job. So ask yourself when you're writing your role's requirements, how many years of experience is necessary to do this job? How did you arrive at that number? Why do you stand by it? Is experience with X tool or Y CRM really necessary? Could you teach it on site instead? Things like that. This also might look like sharing your DEI commitment right in the job post, outlining the available advancement opportunities in the role right in the job post, or even outlining some of the expectations that folks might expect to encounter on their first day in the office, such as, Hey, we don't wear jeans in the office. That might be something people want to know up front, right? But you might counter that by adding an additional incentive or a benefit of working with you right in the job posting language. Like we do have an aggressive 401k matching program, for example. Step number two, revise your interview questions. If you constantly feel like you are fighting generational battles, consider changing your interview questions right up front to better align candidates' expectations with your role responsibilities. So this might look like asking, what experience do you have when it comes to, insert skill set here, right? Can you describe a time when you demonstrated a skill set in a job, a volunteer, or a school setting? Asking them up front, what expectations do you have regarding things like advancement in the career path, professional development opportunities? And you might even consider positing your company's current policies regarding performance reviews, raises, yearly pay increases, bonus structures. You might even consider conducting a pay equity analysis. And you might not need to share that necessarily during the interview, but it might help you prepare for these interview questions. Number three, know your company's OPT and CPT information. If you don't know what OPT and CPT is, this slide is especially relevant to you. Um, and I feel extra qualified to talk about this because I handle putting career fairs on Handshake. And this is a question that employers will get on career fair registration, which I then field. Many registrants will check off that they accept this, but they actually have no idea what it means. It's consistently inaccurate, but it is absolutely necessary information for you to know and communicate to any international candidate. So this might look like knowing the answer to this question and checking the box or leaving it blank on Handshake. This is especially relevant if you do a lot of online work like posting jobs to Handshake or registering for career fairs. But if you are somebody that comes to campus, you should expect this answer from any student that you run into, whether it's a career fair candidate or a student that walks by your table. And you should be able to, again, answer it with confidence. Number four, create an open dialogue. Gen Z wants to feel, again, like they're contributing to social impact. It's one of the biggest factors that they consider when applying for jobs. So we know that they wanna have a personal connection with their role and having a personal connection with their team and manager helps with this. It really starts the whole process off really. So this might look like establishing a mentorship opportunity with the Gen Zer, or if that's not something you personally are interested, interested in, you could enable a mentorship to happen between a Gen Zer and a more senior member of your company. This might look like offering tons of feedback opportunities, whether it's you providing feedback to them or whether it's you soliciting feedback from them. Or it might look like different ways to socially connect. Maybe you have, maybe you're remote already, but if you connect virtually, do you have a social Teams or a Slack group? And if you are in person or hybrid, how do you conduct your team meetings? Could you maybe consider going to a different location for them, like a coffee shop? Could you host a team retreat? Do you want to do volunteer work together? Do you have post-work hangouts scheduled? 
Step number five, make on-site trainings available and digitize them. Remember, Gen Z is motivated to do good work for you. So one of the greatest things you can do for an employee, even if you can't compensate them any more than you already are, is provide them with development opportunities. Work is more than a salary. It's a chance to learn. Tap into that. Help foster growth by offering personal development trainings and make them digital to lessen your workload and appease Gen Z's preference for online learning. So this might look like assessing training needs and surveying employers for gaps in knowledge. It might look like tapping into the potential of experienced professionals. So your tenured employees or your managers or your HR professionals, or maybe you wanna lean on an outside expert who's uh, professionally trained to provide these types of trainings. Or maybe it looks like something as simple as purchasing a LinkedIn learning license. Moving forward, make policy changes. So this is where we start to get into some of those harder, more long-term processes. I know as well as you do that this is easier said than done, but we do know that Gen Z cares a lot about equity and transparency, and they're assimilating more and more and more into the workforce. And that's going to require you to take a hard look at the policies that you have in place, assess them and make plans to address gaps. This might look like assessing your pay ranges and your policies for equity and fairness, challenging leadership to see if roles could be performed in a remote setting, asking yourself what you can, what you can add to your benefits packages that align more with generational desires. Next one, take a hard look at who holds leadership positions. Gen Z grew up in a diverse generation and they'll want to see diversity represented on your leadership team. This might look like consulting with diversity experts, understanding what's not equitable within your organization, eliminating bias from your hiring and recruitment processes or developing talent from within, and even expanding your recruiting circle. So maybe if you only recruit in person at career fairs, you might consider going digital, or maybe you might consider expanding to different geographic areas or tapping into different professional associations that you don't currently utilize. And last one, commit to making a social impact. Gen Z wants to know that they're contributing to something good in the world. Does your organization want the same thing? This might look like offering volunteer days where employees can get paid to volunteer for a social cause they care about, donating a portion of sales and profits or goods and services, investing in ethical sourcing, especially if your company provides goods, or partnering with another company or nonprofit that's already well-versed in social impact practices. As I wrap up this section, I'd like to acknowledge that none of this is easy, and that's okay. I really don't think it's meant to be. We all grew up with different backgrounds, different historical events, regional influences, and our personal environments, and they all shaped the way that we think and exist in the world. Which is why it's really easy to feel like generations live on different wavelengths, and you might be feeling right now that the Gen Z wavelength is really overwhelming and totally unattainable. But you tuned in today because you identified you care. And caring means a lot of things. It means committing to doing the work. It means committing to finding compromise and committing to do the best you can with the tools you have. If you have any questions about how you can get involved with the Career and Internship Center and get in front of Huskies this academic year, please reach out to me. Again, my name is Leah Bothwell, and you can reach me via CIC events at uw.edu or leahkb at uw.edu. Have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are, and thank you so much for tuning into today's webinar. Happy recruiting and take care.